five. We can't undo Grenfell much as we'd like to. What we need to do is to make sure that the lessons that need to be learned are actually enacted. Four. We do not want these people sitting there dictating British foreign policy based on their tribal loyalties to other countries and their own religion. My sense is that most of Priti's votes will go more to Kemi than to Robert Jenrick. So I'm now once a week jabbing myself with Munjaro. Sounds like a Disney film, doesn't it, really? Munjaro. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. It's early September, Alison, and school's back in the broader sense, as the Rockets of Right Thinking is hit with a deluge of news to pick through, looking on at planet Earth from the vantage point of the Planet Normal cockpit. The Tories are inching their way towards a new leader, but surely they should get on with it. Under current plans, His Majesty's Leader of the Opposition won't emerge until early November four months on from Labour's general election victory and after what's shaping up to be a pretty punitive autumn budget statement on October the 30th. Then there's the final report of the public inquiry into the Grenfell Tower disaster in which 72 people tragically died, the UK's most serious residential fire since the World War II. That was more than seven years ago. Again, what took the great and the good so long? Meanwhile, in Germany, the official opposition could soon be Alternative for Deutschland, AFD, who last week became the first hard-right party to win a regional election in Germany since the Second World War, fueled by a wave of discontent about immigration and Germany's foreign policy. And back in Blighty, Labour scrap with immediate effect Ofsted's headline verdict on schools, whether it's outstanding, good, requires improvement or inadequate, after one head teacher tragically committed suicide when her school suffered a downgrade. A tough question even to pose then. But is this the right response when it comes to pupils and school standards? And of course, Alison, something you've written passionately about in Wednesday's Telegraph, link in the show notes to this episode, the latest slaughter of Israeli hostages by Hamas, Labour's response to which left you more than a little Outrage. We're going to try and get through all of this, Alison. But first, the most pressing question, (laughs) your new weight loss plan. (laughs) I knew you wouldn't be able to resist. (laughs) Sorry, I tried. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, well, listeners may be aware I had a bit of a health scare a few weeks ago when I was taken to hospital in an ambulance with chest pains and I had a battery of blood tests which found I was erring towards the pre-diabetic and various other unfortunate markers for everything else. And a doctor had been suggesting for a while that I went on a particular one of the so- so-called weight loss drugs. I don't think that's a very good description of them, but so I'm now once a week jabbing myself with Munjaro. Crikey. Sounds like a Disney film, doesn't it really? Munjaro, in which our feisty heroine... Or, or a dance step maybe. You know, <laughs> yes. you've got the samba, you got the Munjaro. Jaro. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, our heroine is attempting to lose two stone from around her middle. And I don't know if you saw, Liam, there was amazing reports over the weekend. So people will be more familiar with Ozempic, Wigovi. These are based on semaglutide and it's a kind of revolutionary new drug. Crikey, had... This is almost a Velma moment. Sorry, it is. All right, then. Velma <laughs> moment. <laughs> and the thing they thought it did is it makes you full up. So when normal people eat a meal, signal goes from the stomach to the hypothalamus saying, you're full up, fatty. But in some of us, <laughs> the signal is slightly weaker than in others. So we continue. Because it's doused in chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> we continue ploughing on. So the drug, the one I'm on, it sends the full up signal. So you really don't feel hungry at all. In fact, the, the I wrote about it, obviously, in The Telegraph today. And we'll put that link in the show notes. Very nobly had photos of me taken. I did actually have the family dog standing in front of me to obscure my my large stomach. <laughs> well, well, look, let's have it. We're, we're going to come back to this because you and I are going to have a competition, right? Over the next few weeks and months. Okay. You are on what you yourself called in your column, Fatty's Little Helper Drug. <laughs> yes, Halligan goes, oh, Savage, commando, no <laughs> drugs for me, cold turkey, weight loss program. We're going to have a competition, okay? The weight loss can be proportionate to our starting weights. 
and this will be a theme of Planet Normal going forward. But joking aside... We can't be sitting in the rocket of right thinking with it <laughs> gradually sinking and sinking. No, I just, want to, I just want to finish the thought. So the things at the weekend, these huge studies from Harvard and Yale saying that these drugs are not just merely to make you feel full and get you to eat less. They think it will have reduced inflammation and will cut cancer, Alzheimer's, heart disease... If half of these claims are true, Liam, this is going to have a more revolutionary impact on medicine than the invention of the vaccination. The 180 billion we spend on the NHS every year, that could drastically be cut. I mean, one in four adults in Britain is obese. One in five nine to 10 year olds in Britain is obese. If we can make that better, that is going to have the most extraordinary implications for our national health and our national health service. That subject was, of course, a part of your column. The main part of your column, though, Alison, was on these Israeli hostage murders. And something tells me you're not a huge fan of the new foreign secretary. Something I sort of read between the word, the lines. This is David Lammy, who, when he took part in Celebrity Mastermind, said that Marie Antoinette had won the Nobel Prize and that Henry VIII was succeeded by Henry VII. And so why shouldn't he be the Foreign Secretary? Why would you care that a dimwit diplomatic man is representing our nation on the world stage? Yeah, I got very upset about this. The government decided to just sort of cut a couple of the li- a few of the licenses. I think we've got three. 350 licenses of arms to Israel. In fact, Israel only buys under 1% of its arms from the UK. But this was a kind of sixth form, just grandstanding, really. It was like, let's give Israel a bit of a kind of wrap over the knuckles, mainly, as far as I can see, the Labour government, because it because it's so token, it doesn't make any difference at all. But what it does is it It was a a sort of a slap around the face for Israel within 48 hours of six hostages being shot in the back of the head by Hamas. So it obviously has caused incredible dismay around the world indeed, but obviously in Israel where they're just in a moment of great national anguish. So Britain could not have chosen a worse moment to make this gesture. And why one reason I was particularly angry, Liam, is because this is all about placating their Muslim client group. We know Planet Normal listeners will remember that during the general election, we saw lots of these independent candidates running for parliament. People like Jonathan Ashworth lost their seat. But we now have five of these gentlemen from Birmingham and Leicester South and so on sitting in parliament. They've just formed an alliance, the five of them, plus Jeremy Corbyn, the well-known Hamas adjacent former leader of the Labour Party. So this is the Labour government playing politics in the most spiteful way with one of our allies. And as far as I'm concerned, I know that we have some differing views on this, but look, Israel, as far as I'm concerned, is fighting radical Islam, which is probably, is indeed, not probably, is the biggest threat to Western civilization since Nazi Germany. And how does David Lammy react? He announces we are, we're just going to choose this totally dreadful moment to give Hamas a bit of a fillip because that's what we do when people are murdering innocent civilians and to say that Israel was breaking international law it's not but they had to come up cobble together some excuse for their own party political reasons and on the same day the United States not only said that Israel wasn't breaking international humanitarian law but they issued arrest warrants for all of the Hamas leaders so it, it, among other things Liam it's caused strain in the UK's relations with Washington Sorry, this is me ranting, but it's something that really upsets me. And just so Planet Normal listeners know, I'm off to Israel in a couple of weeks to write a long piece for the anniversary of the 7th of October massacres. I'm glad you mentioned in your column the formation of the new group of MPs, if you like, headed by Jeremy Corbyn. That's almost happened under the radar. It has. I mean, we're going to come on to the Tory leadership shenanigans and so on, and that's obviously a fast-moving story now, having yeah. with nothing having happened <laughs> for weeks and weeks. But it, it was Kemi Badenoch who said that when reform MPs came in to Parliament, five reform MPs, and everybody was talking about that, 
she said in her leadership launch recently what she was thinking about and talking about were the five MPs who had come in under a sort of Islamic title. And she was right, wasn't she? Absolutely. And I thought it was a very stirring launch of her campaign on Monday. And I thought that she said, we do not want this in our country. We do not want sectarian politics. We do not want people, we do not want these people sitting there dictating British foreign policy based on their tribal loyalties to other countries and their own religion. We absolutely don't want it. And I was so impressed that Kemi spoke out like that. And Liam, quite honestly, we're going to be, I think this is going to be more and more attractive to British people. And and in the reaction to my piece today about David Lammy, um, apart from people saying that they liked, uh, don't you like old fashioned insults? I called him a grandstanding half wit. I mean, half wit is a good word, isn't it? <laughs> it's a sort of Victorian music hall word, it is, isn't, isn't it? it? He's is. a splendid chap and he's a half-wit. <laughs> exactly. A bounder. <laughs> but we have to be very careful about this now going forward. We can't have our politics being shaped by narrow sectarian interests. We're seeing this terrible stuff with in Iran, in Afghanistan. Women in Afghanistan and girls are literally not allowed to speak now, Liam, in public. They've they've covered their faces and their bodies, but now they're not allowed to talk. So let's never forget where some of this, I mean, obviously, these are not the people in Parliament. I'm sure they're all sort of decent, broad-minded people, but we cannot allow these sort of medieval views to intrude on a modern Western democracy. Now, literally, as we've been recording We've seen some results from the first round of the Tory leadership contest. And here they are. This is the first round of voting. There are many more processes to come before we get to early November. Crikey. So Robert Jenrick scored 28 votes of MPs. Kemi Badenock, 22. James Cleverly, 21. Tom Tugendhat, 17. Mel Stride, 16. Priti Patel, 14. So Priti Patel, who, of course, has appeared on the rocket a couple of times, is out of the race What's your reaction to that, Alison? And where do you think those votes will go? On the face of it, it seems a bit surprising. She was always rather a darling of the party, wasn't she, Pretty? I've been quite disappointed in her approach to this contest. She seems to have been suddenly recasting herself as one of the limper One Nation Tories when she was always been known as a person of the right, hasn't she, and a, and a, and a Brexiteer. But she had, I thought, bizarrely been defending hers and the government's record on immigration when we know, Liam, don't we? <laughs> One of the reasons that many Conservatives refused to vote Tory in the general election was because they were completely disgusted that the government had, had allowed in a couple of million people in, in, in the last three years. So in a way, it's not surprising. The noises she was making seemed to be out of tune with where people are. I'm not surprised that Robert Jenrick has done very well. He's been running an extremely professional, quite convincing campaign. He, I think he's the, no, that's not right. I think he was the only candidate who had said that he was prepared as leader to leave the ECHR because as immigration minister, you'll remember Liam that he, well, he resigned from that post because he was so upset and disgusted that Rishi Sunak and the government wouldn't go further and change the law effectively right in a clause into their Rwanda bill, which would make it more watertight. So Jenrick is talking pretty tough on immigration. Kemi, n- not so much, but we, you and I have talked about this a lot. It comes as no surprise to me that Jenrick and Badenoch would be kind of neck and neck. They seem to me to both have strong cases to make very persuasive Tory leaders. And I will be interested in the in the coming weeks to see see them outlining their cases before. Kemi's prospectus has been a bit more sketchy. I mean, than both, Liam, what's your take? I think the results aren't surprising. Maybe a lot of people would have expected Mel Stride, who's the least well-known of the candidates outside of Westminster, um, to have been knocked out first rather than Pretty. My sense is that most of Pretty's votes will go more to Kemi than to Robert Jenrick because Kemi is the candidate on the right of the field now. 
she's trying to cast herself certainly as a as a candidate of the right who the the Tory reform group the one nation MPs can do business with they made it clear they weren't going to do business with Suella Braverman under any circumstances which is why she's not even part of this contest Jenrick as you say is putting together a really professional campaign he's clearly a challenger he's clearly going to figure heavily in opposition politics throughout this parliament and beyond but yeah that's my sense most of these votes for pretty if you had to choose between generic and badenock would go to badenock but i'm concerned again and i think you are too at how long this is taking it's it seems self-indulgent to me we're not gonna have a leader of the opposition i mean rishi sunak did turn up for parliamentary questions prime minister's questions <laughs> on Wednesday, but where's he been all summer? Has he been with the tech bros in, in, in Los Angeles? <laughs> Could have been to come almost... off his sun lounger at the Beverly Hills Hilton, wasn't it really? I mean, absolutely. Well, that was big of him. I agree. I mean, it looks massively self-indulgent. We are absolutely desperate as this fledgling government lurches from one awful mistake to the next. We, we so need an opposition. I love it when you give a nuanced view. <laughs> Don't tune it. That's what you're here for. Can I just make this point? So hard to do nuance. <laughs> I do that in my writing. I, I won't do it when I'm speaking. Yeah, a couple of technical points that people haven't picked up. So Generic's come top of this so far in this first round. Oh, another Velma moment. There'll be ah, two. Here we Whoa. go. Go on. Yeah. That's the only podcast you've ever done two Echo Scooby <laughs> impressions at any time. Um, yeah, so Jenrick coming top in this first round with the MPs. Now, there are 121 Tory MPs were left standing after the general election route. And it's just a fact, Liam, that many of those are not going to be as robust on certain matters as Kemi or Robert. That's just a fact. So these guys are having to strut their stuff to the MPs to do the splits because lots of those are what I would consider Lib Dems, all right? So they have to be quite careful tiptoeing around their MP colleagues who are going to be to the left of, I think, both of them, actually, to be honest. And then you're going to have the, the two who make it going forward to the members. And Kemi has just is currently the favourite among the members. She's got 34% compared at the moment to 18% for Robert Jenrick. Now, I think the one of the unknowables in this situation is that the Tory members always used to be people like me. <laughs> I was a Tory member. I'm not anymore. And uh, many of our listeners and many Conservatives resigned their membership in disgust, all right? Because the Conservatives, as Kemi said, what was her formulation, Liam? She said, we said we were right and governed as left, all right? We talk right and governed left. So that's the huge complaint. She was that's spot on in her analysis of that. But the situation is a lot of the more right-wing or centre-right Tory members have have left now, and there used to be 150,000 of them. My guess is it's way below 100,000. So essentially, 100,000 Tory members are going to decide this contest. And what if indeed it is Jenrick and Badenoch who go forward? It's going to be quite interesting to see how they pitch it because the people who would have voted Liz Truss against Rishi Sunak, a lot of those will no longer be around. You're good at calling these things. How do you see it shaking down? I think you're right to look at the activist vote, the members of the Conservative Party in the country who will have the final say between the two candidates, as you explained, who the MPs themselves choose. I would still say that a candidate like Badenoch would be the favourite because what we're seeing are current polls of current activists. I agree with you, there has been some churn. But for me... That's a secondary question at this stage, Alison, because the real question at hand is who are the MPs going to let through to be the final two candidates? And we're long enough in the tooth to remember post Blair's victory in 97, battle for the Tory leadership then. There was a campaign within Parliament to stop Michael Portillo yeah. becoming one of the final two because they knew he was the activist's darling and he would then become... Prime Minister. And he, a lot of people in the Parliamentary Party didn't want him to be Prime Minister. And I think that's the danger. I can't see the Parliamentary Party, which as we've discussed over many months on Planet Normal, 
was going to be after the election and now is. There's a lot of One Nation Tories still in Parliament and a lot of the sort of Brexity Red Wall Tories who would go for more right-wing policies, they've now gone. It may be that there's, there will be an operation among MPs to make sure that the left's candidate, Tom Tugendhat, the sort of One Nation Tory, gets through and then faces either Jenrick or Badenoch. That may happen. And that's the danger that either a campaign emerges to stop Kemi or stop Robert, depending on which one of those two the One Nation Conservatives want because I think it's pretty clear if Tom Tugendhat does get through to the activists he's going to lose so it's that's why for me it's going to be either Badenoch or Jenrick but it, I don't think it will be both Badenoch and Jenrick in the final two. Aren't we completely sick of the machinations of CCHQ? <laughs> no. We need someone to oppose now. <laughs> Crikey. I am. I've just done with them because if they obstruct Kemi getting through to the final two, or indeed, I think Jenrick and Adenok should be in the final two. They seem to me to be the most plausible to pull the party back from the. They're in a quagmire, Liam. They, this whole, oh, let's have unity. Do you know James Cleverly, another of the candidates, was actually saying it was all about because we weren't united enough. We didn't. He literally said our successes didn't cut through enough. What successes? You're only mocking the man. You're not mocking a man in a sort of mocking voice. As well. Sorry, not, I'm sorry. We're not united enough. We not. Oh, oh, I'm sure the entire country would have thought, "Oh, thank, oh, thank God, they've let bygones be bygones. Let's give them a huge majority." People were absolutely screaming for them to be dragged out of the building. I mean, anyway, I really think now that if these MPs, some of the weediest wets, if they obstruct the best candidates to recast the. Tory party as a very strong centre-right party. They've got, God knows, Labour's given them an open goal. I mean, already within a couple of months of the general election, Labour is there ready to be taken down with with all these absolutely, this sort of, they look to me so inadequate for government. So a really feisty, strong conservative principles has, has a chance, a real chance. And if they come up with a sort of bien penson candidate, I mean, Tom too, her. I mean, really? Really? Sorry. Anyway, you can, you'll can. you never guess what I think. <laughs> we once had an idea, didn't we? Why don't we record Planet Normal in a bar over a drink? Let's never do <laughs> <laughs> Of course, now I'm having my Munjaro. I can barely... I mean, what's, I... what's in that stuff? <laughs> Sorry. I'm, Look, all, I'm, I, I, I'm, I, pent, I'm pent up after my summer break, you see. I've got so much to say. I really think those people's machinations, <laughs> taking people down... Oh, really, Alison? You've been quite quiet this week, sm- I thought. Smoke-filled rooms, past, past the revolver Jeeves. I mean, leave it out. We need, we need, we desperately need a Conservative, a good opposition, don't oh, we? And a Grange Hill quote to boot. Leave it out, Tucker. Leave, leave it, it out. out. <laughs> Look, I want to get on to okay. Ofsted briefly and and AFD and Times Pressing. But just before we go from this Tory thing, look, the, the debate within the Tory parliamentary party is, oh, we've got to go back to the centre ground because that's where elections are won and lost. But is the centre ground within the sort of political bubble way to the left of where the centre ground is among the country as a whole? Yeah. That is the question here at issue. And I personally think the centre ground of politics is to the right of where the centre ground of what the media and political class thinks is of politics. And I think that's really coming to the fore across many countries in Europe as well. But before we get on to that, this Ofsted verdict, obviously desperately sad and tragic that a head teacher committed suicide and all power and respect to the family of the head teacher who have campaigned for this change. But is it really the right thing to do? I don't think so. Obviously, I taught for a while. I have got lots of friends who are teachers and head teachers. I think that that these Ofsted inspections and their verdicts, teachers fear them, and I understand that. But I think it's essential uh, that schools know where they stand. Parents have the right to know what sort of school their child is going to. And if you start muddying the waters, then you're letting schools off the hook, aren't you? And one of the few 
one of the few of those amazing successes that James cleverly thinks the Conservatives brought about. Genuinely, one of the improvements came from Michael Gove's education reforms. Now, in Wales, my, my homeland, Wales decided to dispense with any of these reforms, the SATs and so on, all the testing, Liam, which was what drove standards up. And Wales, which was once an education powerhouse when I was a child, certainly when my parents were children and absolutely astonishing intellectual history of success. And I think that if you water down um, these standards and scores and the assessments, gradually the pursuit of excellence and dragging up standards sort of drifts away. Bridget Phillips, an Education Secretary, she is insisting that the reports will remain detailed and as objective as they were. That's what she's saying. Parents won't find it as easy. They often want the shorthand of one word. I guess we'll have to see how that happens. I, I, I tread very carefully when I say, but I do think this needs to be said, as you have said, is it really right to make a big change off the back of such a tragedy? I mean, are you really going to get the best objective outcome when emotions are rightly running so high? But we'll see what happens there. And we'd welcome, wouldn't we, emails from teachers and other people working in education to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. And we're very happy to read out emails once we've established the bona fides of the person who have sent them, of course, using another name, if we think that is in the public interest. And finally, Alison, just for this section, AFD in Germany. Crikey, that was a big result. The first regional election victory of a far right party or certainly a hard right party in Germany since the Second World War. And with a general election in Germany coming next year, the sort of centrist schmaltzy politics of the CDU SPD link up. It's really under threat. Well, we were sort of semi predicting it, weren't we? And after the the knife attack just about ten days ago in Solingen, which preceded the vote in those two regions which are former parts of, of East Germany, aren't they? I think that the the sense that Angela Merkel's letting in a million Syrian uh, immigrants might not be playing out as well as she'd hoped. Do you remember her saying, we can do it? And I think there have been consequences for that. So yes, the A the AFD, which is, look, I often dispute. I don't like these people bandy around far right now in this country, which basically means, you know, Alec Douglas Hume would be far right. But, but some of the guys at the top of this party, they're, both, I mean, indiscriminate deportation. No, these are, no doubt about it, some very murky and dubious characters wanting 20% deportations and so on. But nevertheless, it it chimes with something we had Professor Matt Goodwin on Planet Normal. Matt's been talking about this for a long time. The, the, the ruling class, the political class, is hugely adrift from where mainstream public opinion is. And you know my feelings... Uh, after the the massacre of little girls in Southport, there were riots and there were disgraceful attacks on the police and so on. But there was also genuine public disquiet, you know. And in fact, immigration has shot to the top, the most what people consider to be the most important consideration. And now that is not just conservatives; it's shot to the top of all people of all political leanings. Now, that what is that telling you, Liam? And if Keir Starmer put his fingers in his ears, doesn't want to listen, and as long as as long as the sort of leftist intelligentsia is holding those views, refusing to listen to people who haven't wanted to see their communities transformed at a, at a rapid pace, then we could well see what's happened in Germany repeated here. This week, our Planet Normal stowaway is someone who brings huge insight into the Grenfell Tower tragedy and the disastrous path leading up to the unnecessary deaths on the 14th of June 2017 of 72 men and women, including 18 children, following the final report of a drawn-out public inquiry. 
Ian Cox is former chief of Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service, having served for 34 years before being appointed chief fire officer in 2003, a post he held for a decade. In 2009, Ian was awarded the Queen's Fire Service Medal and served as Director of Protection and Prevention within the Chief Fire Officers Association. Currently chairman of the Business Sprinkler Alliance, he is one of the UK's leading authorities on fire safety at a time when the Grenfell tragedy takes foremost place in our national debate. Ian, welcome to Planet Normal. We've been waiting for this day for seven long years. Obviously, it's a huge report, 1,700 pages into this disaster that killed 72 people. What are the immediate points that you take away from Sir Martin Morbick's conclusions? It's thorough, very thorough. It'll take a while to digest, and I welcome it. My worry is that it will take another three years for government to digest it to pick up the points they like and to ignore the points they don't. I'm intrigued, Ian, as an experienced fire officer, when you saw those horrifying TV pictures of the conflagration on the night of June the 14th, 2017, was it a complete shock to you and your colleagues or was it something you feared uh, might happen someday? We had, we feared it would happen. We, well, it has happened. It's happened in Dubai and was it Romania or Bulgaria and various other places around the world where you have these materials. Putting hydrocarbons on the outside of the building means you're going to have severe external fires. Sometimes the internal arrangements aren't that badly affected, either because they're better protected, they have more than one staircase, and or they've got sprinklers. Because sprinklers won't put, put the fire on the outside out, but they will help maintain the tenability inside. So, no, we knew something like this was going to happen. I don't think any of us thought it would be so horrible. There's a long history, though, isn't there, Ian, of cladding-related fires? The Isle of Man Leisure Centre in the early 70s, Knowsley Tower on Merseyside in 91, Lackanall House in Camberwell in South London in 2009. How is it that we've carried on using this flammable cladding for so many years when there have been previous disasters? That's a very complicated question, and, but I think the fundamental problem is that people, some people thought it was covered by the regulations and we couldn't put that sort of stuff on the outside of the building. But when we were trying to tell the regulators that actually that was happening, it was a case of, well, we don't have the evidence. I mean, Peter Rapp's book, you know, Where Are the Bodies? Uh, fire deaths were down, you know, two thirds over a 10 year period. We're down to about 300 a year. But then we lost 72 in one night. And I think government perhaps was lulled into a sense of complacency because fire wasn't a major issue. It was getting better. Fire and Rescue Service was one of the few public sector areas to actually reduce the demand. Everybody else was going up. We save probably seven times as many people from road traffic accidents as we do from fires now. So, But incidents like this can and will happen if we take our eye off the ball. And I think that's fundamentally what happened. You've just talked about Peter Apps's fantastic book, Show Me the Bodies, How We Let Grenfell Happen, which I read in over the weekend and on every other page. I was just scrawling, dear God, how is this allowed to happen? Just coming back to what Liam mentioned about this Lackanal house fire in 2009, which also involved those highly flammable ACM panels. Six people died at Lackanal, but it was during the day, so clearly it was easier to get people out. Now, the coroner at the inquest said that the building regulations must change with particular regard to the spread of fire over the external envelope of the building. And she also encouraged the government to bring about the retrofitting of sprinkler systems, which I know is one of your particular areas of interest. They didn't change anything, in, did they? Would Grenfell have happened if they'd enforced the recommendations of the coroner? You can't say it wouldn't, but the chances are it probably would not. You know, you, hindsight, you can't be, um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Foresight, you, there's always some possibility that it would go wrong. But I don't think it would go wrong so badly and so quickly. I think the the issue was that the, I mean, one of the comments that I think I picked up from, we, we don't need to kick, kiss the coroner's ass. Yes. You do need to do your duty. And I do feel that I know people were under-resourced and I know people are under pressure. And there's always another side to that. You know, you've got to balance these things because resources are finite. But I do think basically fire safety was put at the bottom of the barrel and ignored. 
it's not a big problem, mainly as I said, because fire deaths were down. Five in Lackanor House was a tragedy, but it didn't have the same impact. When you lose 20, 30 people in a train crash, there is more call for action and for things, something must be done, than the fact that 20 or 30 people died the same day on the roads. When people die en masse, you know, we've seen it at Hillsborough, at the Manchester bombing, etc., it, it, it evokes a different reaction in the public and people want to see action. And unfortunately, that's what we've seen here. That, you know, after Lackanel, we didn't see the mass uprising, did we? After Grenfell, we did. The biggest contributor to the fire, according to the report, was Rayno Bond 55, this cladding manufactured by a company called Arconic. Now, this raises the question because, you know, that the architects who are putting, slapping this on the side of Grenfell failed to recognise that cladding and insulation were combustible. It seems to me, Ian, that the UK had far less stringent standards for building materials than almost any other European nation. Were we a dumping ground for inferior, dangerous products? I'm not an expert in the market, but from Peter Apps' book and elsewhere, I understand that they were selling the flammable products into uh, England and Wales, whereas a lot of other uh, countries, including Scotland, after the Irvine uh, Tower Block fire, had stopped using it or had barred the use of it. So I think we were, a, call it a dumping ground, but they, people will sell where they can. And the trouble is we need a system which makes sure that the cowboys are caught and the ignorant are educated. Because I think there are two categories here. Some people just did not know what they were doing. They were out of their depth and didn't know it. Other people knew what they were doing and they were doing it for financial motives. The, I believe, and you know, I know nothing that, be, that you don't know, but I'm sure some prosecutions will follow from this. And not only will that be justice some form of justice for the victims and their families, it will also send a message that there are consequences. I believe in the, in the Roman times, when they uh, built an aqueduct, before they took the scaffolding away, the architects stood underneath it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you want skin in the game. Yes, very good, yes. That'll incentivise them. Ian, as a, somebody who's devoted their professional life to fire safety, let me run these figures past you. 4,630 residential buildings in the UK of 11 metres and over still have these Grenfell-style flammable cladding on them as per the end of July. These are government figures. The remediation work's been done on just over 1,300 blocks. That's less than 30% of the buildings that need to be changed. Thousands of people then in social housing, in private housing, are living in tower blocks surrounded by cladding, which the government has already says breach fire safety laws. Given your professional experience, how does that make you feel? I would fret for them. Uh, I feel for them. I, it, it must be an, something to go to bed every night wondering if you're going to be the next grand. Uh, so that, that's truly awful. The fact is, it is unlikely but the worry of it must be extreme. Um, I mean, Grenfell had fires before that didn't spread outside. You do need the right or wrong combination of circumstances, but that would be, be of no comfort whatsoever if I was putting my head on a pillow in a building that had hydrocarbon slapped to the outside. The worry would be, is it going to happen to me and mine? Why we haven't been more proactive? Th there are... Problems, logistical problems. I mean, where do you put the people while you're doing the work? Where do you get the product? Where do you get the competent people who can put it, put stuff on properly? So it, it, I appreciate it's not as simple as just saying we'll do it all tomorrow. We just wouldn't have the resources or the capacity, but we should have done it a lot quicker. I'm afraid we spend more time arguing about who should pick up the bill than actually getting the job done. There is a lot of greed in this story, isn't there, Ian? So let's look at the developers' greed. I was shocked to discover that there are only two countries in the developed world which don't require two staircases in high-rise buildings. One is South Korea and the other is the UK. In Canada, if you've got a building of four storeys or over, it has to have two staircases. So that's obviously a huge factor for evacuating a building. Can I? Can we come to the response on the night by the fire service? 
service. Now, the principle of high-rise safety in the UK is based on something called compartmentation. When the fire breaks out in a flat, the smoke and flames should be contained in that one space. Didn't happen in Grenfell, as you say, because the fire managed to get out and was raging up the side, eating up those faulty or highly flammable panels. Ian, when it was clear that the fire was raging and the compartmentation had failed, the stay put plan remained and didn't change until a senior guy called Andrew O'Loughlin said it was unsustainable at 2.35am when 116 Grenfell residents were still in the tower awaiting rescue. Was the fire service too high bound by rules to abandon that stay put plan and tell people to get the hell out? I'll be honest, and I say I think they were a little slow to do that, but I understand the reticence in the sense that, was it Dawkins, the, the first officer in charge, when he gave evidence, a, a friend, uh, this is in Peter Rapp's book, I think. And I yes, heard it Martin through. Dawkins, yes. Yeah, Martin Dawkins. I heard it elsewhere as well. If he, for example, had taken the, the stand that he's going to overrule state put policy and get everybody out, and people had died in that staircase, even if, say, only 30 people had died, he would have been the firefighter who killed 30 people because he went against policy. If, I don't know if you recall Atherston in Warwickshire. Uh, I've forgotten the date now, but, but four firefighters were put on a gross negligence, the three firefighters were put on gross negligence manslaughter charges. The, and they were the officers in charge of the first appliances. They weren't senior officers like you know, the chief fire officer or anything. And that was because they felt that they put them into the wrong position. So crews at the front line, they're dealing with a very rapidly evolving situation. They've got people literally screaming in their faces. They've got more fire than they've been trained to believe possible coming out of the building. So I have immense sympathy for the situation they were in. But yes, maybe they should have rescinded that earlier. I do think there's a a slight of policy blindness. I think it's changed. If you recall the Cube, the fire in 2019, and student accommodation, and the officer in charge, I believe, rescinded the stay put policy before he got out uh, out of the fire engine when he arrived. He could see it was not going to be stopped. Therefore, get everybody out. And they did. It took the government 23 months simply to publish the proposals for the scope of this consultation, the public inquiry, which has just ended. So almost two years to even frame the inquiry. We're now seven years on from Grenfell from June 2017. Given the drawn out inquiry, it's going to be late 2026 at the earliest until the first defendants appear in court for the first time. So it's going to be more than 10 years before any possible convictions. These delays, as well as the cost of the inquiry and the delays, what must they do to the families who are looking for closure? Drawing something out like this doesn't do anyone any good, does it? The victims, the fire service, how does it happen? I mean, that's, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm afraid that's, I mean, the inquiry, the uh, police can't act until the inquiry was finished. The inquiry's taken longer than they thought, mainly because they've uncovered more than they expected. The fact that it's thorough, I fully support and I appreciate it's taken time. It should have happened quicker. But if we'd done it more quickly and badly, guilty people might have got off the hook. So, we, you know, the law is slow, but it grinds very fine. I do think there's some issues about resources. Maybe they could have put more resource into it. But to take the witnesses, and we've seen the plethora of witnesses, and some of it highly harrowing, some of it highly technical, you know, I, I hope and believe the police will now act more swiftly. Uh, what do they say? Justice delayed is justice denied. And I think, you know, you can, you can see the anger in Grenfell United and the families, understandable anger. I, from a professional point of view, we can't undo Grenfell much as we'd like to. What we need to do is to make sure that the lessons that need to be learned are actually enacted. All too often, lessons have been learned and nothing happens, nothing changes. Um, I'd, I'd like to go back to a couple of principles. When I was first in fire safety as opposed to squirting water, uh, one of the principles was you turn your back on the fire and make your way unaided to a place of safety. If we had that as a principle in designing buildings, I mean, you have dead end conditions, you know, and that should be no more normally than 12 metres and that sort of thing. So you do allow for real world conditions. But if you could do that, 
Fine. I also go back to something, for it to be boring here, but post-war building studies, which set a lot of the information out that we've turned into the current codes and regulations. And one of the, the principle was to safeguard life and property. Now, the current um, building regulations only look after life. I, apart from the fact that if you protect the property, you in, inevitably protect life to a higher standard, you also save people's livelihoods or their living quarters. So I think you know, post-war building studies have three aims, to reduce or prevent fires, to limit fire development, and to provide for the safe exit of occupants. We should go back to some of those basic principles, and then the argument about two staircases would go away, because you'd have to have two staircases. You know, in all this technical detail that we're hearing, and, you know, people can slightly tune out, but what I've been thinking about, Ian, is that at the end of all this mismanagement, neglect, greed, were mothers with small children hiding in a bathroom with wet towels around their faces with the smoke pouring in under under the door. So we must never forget the consequences of what these people did in various positions of authority. Now, one of the most stinging remarks in the report, British regulators put commercial interests above building safety and had been complicit in allowing manufacturers to manipulate fire testing data. Now, how does your service, how does the fire service, how do individual fire officers feel about the way that these regulations were manipulated to allow this absolutely catastrophic thing to happen. And let's never forget, and I know you won't, Ian, that your colleagues, you know, men and women were running in and out of that tower facing temperatures. I mean, you know, they were practically, their masks were practically melting, weren't they? Yeah, no, and the bravery of the crews going in, I yeah. don't think this was questioned. It was the policy and the plans they were trying to, you know, that they were being led by that, that was quite widely questioned. Yeah, I've, I've been in fires. I, I've actually, on one occasion, there was a bedroom fire. The lady died. And when we got there, it was her own bedroom. The walls were smoke blackened. And we saw her handprints going around the, the room three times. Chest height, waist height just above the skirting board. She crawled around her own bedroom three times. I couldn't find the door. It's what smoke does to you. So we feel it viscerally and we're angry. Uh, we, you know, we try and be professional, but we are angry when it's quite clear that people were deliberately bending the rules. Ignorance, you can be annoyed, but when people aren't doing it knowingly, maybe they should have known Maybe they were incompetent and they should be incompetent. But that's why we need to improve the education, part of the reason you know, the things we're doing with various bodies. But where people knowingly bend the rules or make claims that are untrue, just for profit's sake, that's where I hope the police will step in. Ian, thanks so much for coming on Planet Normal at, at this time. It's really valuable that we can hear from somebody with such knowledge in this area. Just finally, what's your message to ministers now? What should they do? Bite the bullet. Actually do things. I mean, a couple of the things that they've said, the record of recommendations, 11340, says that actually every time a coroner or an inquiry makes a recommendation, the government should record it and state what they have done. That will hold people's, and I'm sorry, I was about to say hold their feet to the fire, but, but that will hold people accountable. Also, 11.13.41, forest assessors, mandatory accreditation. I'm afraid if regulation, if self-regulation worked, we wouldn't need speed cameras, would we? Some things need to be mandated, not guided. Final, final point I would make, we've got to get the right balance between regulation, enforcement and competence. Regulation needs to be clear, enforcement needs to be resourced, and competence needs to be largely done through third-party certification. Other people are saying you're competent. You're not just claiming it for yourself. If we can get that balance right, then the, I think hopefully the built environment in the future will be safer than it is now. Ian Cox, former chief of the Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Thanks so much for appearing on Planet Normal. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We learn so much from you, the citizens of Planet Normal. 
This is from Peter. How long until Sir Keir Starmer bans the Planet Normal podcast because it dares to speak to the truth? This government is truly, truly awful. Um, had a lot of emails, Liam, about my column on Israel and Hamas and, uh, and uh, David Lammy, indeed. And Michael says, even as a firm supporter of the Palestinians, having worked in the Gulf for 30 years and having many Palestinian friends and colleagues and knowing the injustices and repression f- that they face... I can accept Hamas as an evil terrorist organisation that carried out the 7th of October atrocities in the full knowledge of the Israeli response. That a British government can give succour to Hamas the day after it murdered six Israelis in cold blood is almost beyond imagination until one remembers Labour's humiliation by Muslim voters at the last election when even John Ashworth lost his seat. Rather than support Israel, David Lammy and Keir Starmer are debasing themselves and Britain in the hope of reclaiming the Muslim vote. This is no surprise to many, as Starmer and Reeves lied through their teeth regarding taxes, as we now see a government happy to penalise the old and poor to reward their union bosses and paymasters. How can our allies trust this government if they are prepared to dump Israel when it suits them? And Stuart, on the same theme... In her Telegraph column, Alison describes Foreign Secretary David Lammy as an over-promoted chump, a giant numpty and grandstanding half-wit. Come on, he's not that good. You flatter him, Alison. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> right, we've now got another challenger to Bob the Bard. Oh. A new Planet Normal poet is weighing in. And this is Steve with Dear Kears, Many Tears, a Limerick-style poem, On our new Prime Minister, says Steve. Things can only get better, so things can only get wetter. Is what Keir of the Tears has forecast. It's too bad for us proles, but we're full of black holes, and it looks like this shower will last. Dear Keir is to rule for all people, but you'll feel the full force of the law. If you dare repeat what was writ in a tweet, you'll be banged up doing porridge for sure. (laughs) The judges will gleefully concur that you may now be jowled for harsh words. But men who are violent and want women compliant are spared doing stir. It's absurd. With your downbeat assessment of blighty and each new pronouncement of frighty. (laughs) (laughs) And the old without fuel, it's positively cruel. You may just have gone too far. Righty? <laughs> that is Steve, the new challenger for the coveted title of Bard of Planet Normal. And Steve adds, I love the podcast, one of the few sane places in an increasingly mad world. Well done and well done for reading it out well, Liam. Limericks aren't easy to read out. This is about what we talked about, about same theme, Sir Keir Starmer's two-tier justice. Judith says... Dear Alison Liam, I've just finished listening to this week's brilliant Planet Normal. I have to confess I needed a break after Alison's reference to two-tier justice. As a retired lawyer, I'm horrified at these developments. I was proud to be a lawyer, but now I wonder whether it was worthwhile. Liam's interview with Toby Young of the Free Speech Union was fascinating. I've admired Toby's work for several years now. Keep up the good work. And to balance that, John disagrees. The idea, John says, suggested by Alison that it was the Prime Minister who prompted the crackdown on those who goaded others to violent action in the recent riots and that he was wrong to do so is outrageous. This accusation presumes that the PM intervened in the administration of justice without any evidence and that incitement to violence should not be considered to be a criminal offence. Let the courts decide, says John, not Planet Normal. And this is from David. Dear Alison Liam, firstly, thank you so much for helping me maintain some semblance of sanity in a world that increasingly defies logic. I've been a listener since the podcast began. I've attended both your London live shows and without my weekly dose of right thinking and common sense, I don't know where I'd be. For me, the Tories' most likely route back to power lies with Kemi Badenoch. She appears to be a credible leadership candidate with a great story to tell. I believe she can cut across class, cultural and age divides in a way that few Tory leaders ever have. Under her stewardship, the Tories might just have a chance of making this a one-term Labour government. And yet I get the impression she is being marginalised by the Tory parliamentary rump in an attempt to keep her off the final ballot. Can you two explain why? 
I noted that even Lord Frost has, op- has opted to support Robert Jenrick, and I'm puzzled as to why there appears to be relatively little support for the candidate most likely to appeal to the wider electorate. What am I missing? I would be most grateful for your trusted insight. Well, we did just kind of cover that, didn't we? We did. I, I do think, I mean, obviously... I, and we will continue to do so in the weeks to come. We will. I have huge regard for David Frost, and I think his backing, Robert Jenrick, is, is extremely sound. There are some people who think Hemi is a bit abrasive and that could end with her being in trouble. Although there are also, there was there was some woman, Tory leader, Liam, I can't think of her. She was quite abrasive, wasn't she? The one with the one with the blonde <laughs> helmet of hair. What was she I called? I can't quite think can't of her think, name. No. Yeah, but, but finally, there's Woody. Here he is. I just want to let my co-pilots know that the in-flight entertainment on board this rocket is second to none. <laughs> Whether this rocket's destination is, I'm firmly buckled in and listen intently for the duration. Just one thing. And we covered this earlier too. We haven't had the drinks trolley down at the back yet. Well, Woody, <laughs> now you know why I warned you at the top of this podcast. Because if she's like this without the drink with her new Manjaro drug, imagine if it was Manjaro spruced up with four large gin and tonics. Woody, I've put Liam in the stewardess's <laughs> outfit. I've explained how to push the trolley. I've given him the mini gins with tonic. I mean, you know, I'm sorry. We'll get back to you shortly. Thank you both for your broadcast. Concludes Woody. Do not underestimate how much people appreciate and enjoy your efforts. Kind regards, Woody. And on that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views, Email of the week, it's my turn. And I tell you what, Bob, you know, Steve's, he's on your tail. He's giving you a run for his money. Steve, you get a Planet Normal mug. Now, Bob's got about 15 Planet Normal mugs. He actually (laughs) asks us not to send him a Planet Normal mug again. He hasn't got space for them. So Bob's probably doing a nice trade on the dark web selling Planet Normal (laughs) mugs. But Steve, you are the winner of this week's Rare as Walking Horse Poo Planet Normal mug tea and coffee receptacle send us your postal address to plant normal at telegraph.co.uk and put in the subject heading mug winner if you enjoy planet normal please leave us a rating and a review on spotify the podcast app, go on or where yeah go on five stars go on five stars well you know you can give five stars to me give three and a half to my fatty rival <laughs> Shut up. (laughs) And as we speed away from our beloved planet Normal and the madness of planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bajard, Casso and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. Take measures at the ready. And it's goodbye from him. God, no, what have we done? (laughs) 